All right, if you're ready, I'm ready. Kelsey Dahlia, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thanks for having me, Brett. I'm doing really well. Well, good stuff. Where are you coming from right now? I am in Louisville, Kentucky, in my, my home. Now, you've been living there a while now. How long has it been? This is my 10th year. Wow. Wow. Is it something that you see as a permanent thing? You're going to be living there for even after you finish swimming or, or it's just a swimming thing? Mm -hmm. I don't see us moving unless some job opportunity really takes us away, but we have a great community here and I really love the city. Now I, I grew up in Australia and horse racing is nuts down there in Australia. I imagine where you are, it's, it's a big deal too, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, Churchill Downs is, you can see the football stadium for UofL and Churchill Downs. They're super close to each other. And really, if you're going to go to the Derby, you better just walk, park at the pool and walk. Really? It's, it's just chaos. But I love the, the horse racing, uh, the culture that we have here. And um, I actually haven't been to Derby yet just because it's so crazy. 160,000 people come. But mm. I've been to Oaks where the Phillies race the day before and mm. some other races during the year. And it's a lot of fun to bet and cheer for the horses. It's crazy. It's a whole nother world that it's kind of like the swimming community. When you're in the swimming community, you think that's the center of the universe. But then like you get into the horse racing community, it's a whole completely different world. It's wild. And the horses are so strong and beautiful to see up close. And it's, yeah, it's a really cool experience. I bet. Uh, absolutely. Um, well, listen, congratulations on newly minted world record holder from just a couple of weeks ago. Is that the first time you've broken a world record? I've had the chance to be on relays where we've broken world records, but I've always felt like the weakest link in the relays. <laughs> and so to break a record individually is just a yeah, completely different experience. And it still sounds a little bizarre. <laughs> is it, does, it's a, has it changed the way you think about yourself in terms of um, any type of confidence that you have about yourself? A, a little bit, I think, just in, in that... The, the other accomplishments I've earned feel like they mean a little bit more as well. And so, um, yeah, I think I can carry myself a little differently, but I don't know how long it will last. We got short course worlds coming up, so I'm excited to follow along and cheer for Team USA, but it is really cool to be a world record holder today. That's true. It is. It is starting tomorrow. Are there any threats you think to who's the, who's the person or people that could threaten that world record the most you think? I think Maggie will have a really good shot and who knows how, how Tori and Claire will do. I don't know where all of them will be in their college like preparation right. in terms of the season, but I think they all can, they have what it takes. How do you feel about it? I'm, I mean, I just had Tim Hinchy on the, uh, on the podcast and we talked about the fact that the selection criteria selection policy has come under question recently because obviously um you know th there's been some people who felt like they deserve the chance to be on that team how do you feel about it i i'm also a little bit frustrated and it haven't really been in the past because i've been selected for the teams but now to be on the outside it is disappointing not to have a, a chance but we've also haven't had isl to really challenge the selection criteria quite as much. Uh, you can just see USA Swimming doesn't put much weight in the in short course worlds in general. Just how they the, the funding goes and how people are selected for different committees and things. But I think it's time that, in terms of uh, prize money and and just mm -hmm. having a chance to represent Team USA, we need to reevaluate the selection procedures yeah i agree i mean swimming has definitely professionalized a lot since maybe they even created this this policy that they have based on how they select um i, I believe it's off the the long course times you know so this year it was based off trials you know um you so know not not even actually it was based on the national team so oh. someone like erica brown who finished second at trials wasn't selected for the short course worlds because they just selected times from the whole season but they they looked at long course times only right only long course times okay yeah it's interesting but yeah I, i'm not sure exactly when this particular policy started but it's swimming has 
changed and evolved, especially like you said, now with the ISL and, and the chances that you get to race. What do you think then, if you had suggestions for them, you know, you're obviously disappointed, but if you could speak to the committee, what do you think you would say in, in terms of your preference for how a team like this would be selected? Mm. I think the best case scenario would be to host a meet where you could be have a full selected team. But in the fall, things are a little bit crazy. So I think if we could open up and do a full year and maybe even include yards times, and I think that's how they were selecting short course uh, dual on the pool in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so just to have a little bit more fair to do a full short course selection because you can be super athletic and be really good at short course. And that's totally different than where you're really swimming in long course. So we're kind of comparing two different things, but some people can succeed really well at both. And I think we do have some of that on this team, but I'm just really excited to see how it all pans out. How do you view yourself? You're you're obviously somebody that has had a great amount of success, short course yards, short course meters now, and long course. Uh, in terms of the the three different courses, where do you feel most comfortable, and um, where are you kind of your strengths and weaknesses? Well, I try not to have a preference, but if I'm really honest deep down I do love the short course swimming <laughs> I, I love the walls and getting to use my underwaters those are my strengths and so I love getting to maximize that in the short course pool uh, but it's been so long since I've been able to race yards so most recently I've loved getting to swim so frequently in ISL and getting to make those adjustments from match to match and getting to get faster each week so that's been a lot of fun but of course, Olympics is long course meters. And I, so that's why I understand why USA Swimming puts so much emphasis on that rather than short course. But when FINA makes it a priority and now we're having so many other competitions, I think it's time to prioritize that as well. So I try not to have a preference, but if I'm honest, I enjoy hmm. getting to some extra walls. Fair enough. That's that's a good point. Um, I see that you're representing Cali today, and, and you're just uh, coming to. off the big final. How do you feel about the final? There was uh, a lot of great swimming, um, the, a, a really tight team competition, a little bit of controversy. But how how did you feel about the the two days? I was so proud of our team. Overall, every person I felt like saved their best swims for the final, and they did the best when it mattered most. And so I was really proud of how everyone stepped it up. Across the board, there was so much improvement. We had a lot of new people for the first time on the Condors. And at first I could tell they were a little bit nervous. We were the champions from last season and weren't sure how they were gonna fit in, but everyone fit in from a culture standpoint. They, we were able to really connect and be really intentional about that. That wasn't something that happens by accident is building those team connections and that camaraderie. And uh, not everyone had had the NCAA experience. And I think that's what we had last year. Every female on our team was American and most people had had a good college experience and knew what it meant to put team above everything else. And even though we had a lot more That was a sacrifice by doing an event that they weren't as comfortable with or someone else had to do their best event. Uh, everyone knew that it was for the team. But um, I think Nick Fink was our real MVP. And I'm mm. bummed that he wasn't the official MVP because he stood up and his swims inspired me. I had never beat Sarah in a 50 fly. And I, had to, I knew I had to capitalize on her being tired. That was her third race. So uh, that was also a little extra motivation. But... Uh, so many people on our team really stood up when it mattered the most. Yeah, Nick Fink was massive. That's a that's a that's a good one. I got to get him on the show and have a chat with him. He's 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 just a performer. Like he seems to show up in the big moments, and 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 people kind of maybe um, doubt him for whatever reason, but he's he's consistent. You know, like uh, I mean, I watched this guy compete for Georgia four years in a row at, at SECs. He, he won SECs four years in a row. It's just like. He just knows how to get it get it done and so um impressive from him destro swim towers gain strength in the water with a tower of power save 150 dollars 
for a double swim tower by using code BRETT, B-R-E-T-T, at checkout. Destromachines.com. In terms of the disqualification, how did it affect you personally? How did you see that it affected the team? Mm-hmm. It was definitely a shock. We were standing behind the blocks at the finish and seeing the DQ and we're all a little bit stunned. And I turned to the official and I'm asking him like, what's this about? Can you explain this to me? And it was an official on the turn end. So he wasn't aware of why the disqualification was called. And then we walk over to our coaching staff. And at that point I knew there was nothing we as swimmers could do, but I looked to our coaches staff and it's like, can we need to do something, get over there and figure this out. And so all I knew was I I said to our girls, okay, we got to move on from this. It's out of our hands. The coaching staff is going to fight for us, but we got to move on and we got to get ready for the next thing, warming down, moving on. So that way we can be our best for the next day and get ready to fight. So uh, our coaching staff did the best they could. I not really sure still why exactly the call was called from the video that I saw it looked like a simultaneous touch, but it's for, uh, I don't know how much we're going to go into that, but definitely still frustrated with how that call was called. But I appreciate that our whole team never blamed Lily and we still stood by her. She's been a massive contributor for our team, so consistent. And so uh, all we knew was we were getting ready to fight for day two after that call. And so I'm really proud of how our team just came together from that. It didn't divide anyone, and we had a chip on our shoulder the next day. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think it's it feels good to kind of call conspiracy theory, and you know? <laughs> that's kind of like a, a cool thing. And but I mean, the reality is we we have video these days, and maybe in the past we haven't had video access before. I mean, these are kind of touch touch situations. I mean, I've been part of uh, teams in college where you know, you're like, how, how did you come up with that decision? You know, like I've, I've been on the other end of it too. So I've kind of experienced that. Have you had any previous experience with, with some bad calls, maybe, you know, in, in competing with at Louisville or anything like that? Mm-hmm. I, I'm sure some relays over the year, Arthur is definitely one to fight for, the, for his right. athletes. And so right. uh, he can, get a little rambunctious I guess and yeah. <laughs> but you know that he'll do anything um, for us as swimmers uh, but I do remember when I had my freshman year I was at the uh, Mesa Grand Prix it was called at the time and it was the 100 fly and I was looking like a favorite in the final and they were doing interviews and I remember thinking oh man I do not want to do an interview, but I ended up touching the wall first <laughs> and thinking, oh gosh, now I have to do an interview. And I, I'm still not the, by far the best at all in doing post-race interviews, but at that point I had zero experience. And <laughs> <laughs> But then the official came up to me and said, you were disqualified and they <laughs> did a 15 meter violation call and Arthur fought for it. And the video was a little bit at weird angles and it, I think it was good for me to do that something like that then because it has kept me from being super careful about my 15 meter mark since then and knock on wood I've been really safe since then and but yeah that's one that I remember for sure having that that call and it was a little controversial but you're glad probably I didn't like, have to do the interview I'm glad I didn't have to do the interview exactly um <clears throat> I've talked to some of the the best underwater male kickers in the world recently Coleman Stewart one of them um, Tom Shields another from your perspective uh, from a female perspective uh, one of the best in the world at this how do you develop your underwater kick um, take take me through kind of the specifics of it like you know how, how many kicks do you take how have you trained that what's the best form of training to develop your underwaters uh, from your perspective, if you could kind of run us through that, that'd be really helpful. Mm-hmm. So I'm really type A. So every practice, I'm counting my kicks, at my stroke count, not just every practice, but every lap pretty much. Um, I'm always trying to think about my distance per stroke, distance per kick. And so this development has been over 10 years. And mm-hmm. I started my freshman year. I had an ankle injury after my freshman year. And so that took out my weapon going into that summer and I think from there it was just 
trying to build off of that again. But it was started out by maybe six kicks off every wall and fly my freshman year and then building an extra kick year after year from there. Um, but it's kind of like a science. I played around with my stroke count, my kick count at each match in ISL and made adjustments. And I ended up taking one less kick off my last wall uh, during my world record swim. So that way I could hit the wall better, take an extra stroke rather than going into too much hypoxic swimming, kicking at the end. Uh, because then I kind of just go into like seizure mode and I'm not really mm-hmm. moving too far, too much farther forward. It's faster just to get on top of the surface. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've worked with the same strength coach at UofL for 10, going on my 10th year as well. His name's Jason Durking. And so I think a lot of my development has come from the weight room as well. And it doesn't just start from the, the underwater swimming or off the wall, but also how you push off and working on my push-offs and being really explosive, how I hold my line. I'm not just rushing into the first kick, trying to be patient, carrying the speed. Uh, And then also on the breakout as well, trying to surge and carry as much speed as possible, not rushing through. And so each component is so important, um, but really thinking about the up kick, down kick, having a good balance in that. Uh, But I do love underwaters I could do. 25s underwater all practice I'm really, really proud of my uh, my lung capacity i guess and <laughs> well in, ter- in terms of, of that i mean it's easy to be really good on the the first lap and maybe even off the wall you know um but but obviously on that on that last lap on that last underwater is where kind of this separation between maybe even some of the top athletes in the world at the nca level for sure at at the level that you're racing at now, the ISL, that last wall is is crucial. It's vital. So, like, how do you do the training for that last wall? Mm-hmm. That's a really good question, and I think um, it's just being consistent. And we do uh, we this. My training has changed a little bit in this fall, but mm-hmm. obviously, I've had so much of a base from Arthur's training, and then this. Fall, I started working more with our sprint coach, Chris Lindauer, and he helped train the guys on the four, on the 200 medley relay at NCAAs that won this past season. And so I wanted to mix it up for my mental health this fall and just try something different because I haven't done um, that specific sprint training um, since my sophomore year. So I wanted to try something different. And so I've just been doing singles since trials and a lot less aerobic and more power base. And so with that, we do a lot of 25s or no breath, just working on 50 pace. And um, it's the accumulation of that where my body's trying to break down, but I'm still trying to keep the same tempo, same high level. Um, We'll also do some 50s back to back to back and which is kind of simulating like a skins. And so it's about trying to maintain that and stay at the same speed and trying not to fall too far off of that. And I think that's what helps me on that last 25. And it's also how I approach the race. If I'm super stressed and tense going into it, I'm going to use way too much energy on that first lap. Mm -hmm. And it's such a balance because if I'm really using everything and uh, way too, um, yeah, just tense, I guess, the first 50, then my last 25 is really going to suffer. So trying to carry and use as much free speed in the beginning of the race so affects how I bring that last 25 home. Interesting. I I do want to dig into the changes that you've made in in a second. I I just want to kind of touch on a little bit more of this development of your kick a little bit more and and dig into that. Do you do um, primarily kicking on your stomach, uh, on your back, on a board, you know, when you're doing sprint kicking, how do you mix it up? Mm -hmm. I do all my kicking on my back. My board kick is not very good. So I've seen your challenge for the Mm. 50 kick (laughs) and I'm not sure how I would fall on that, but a few people have said that. Yeah. (laughs) I do a, a good mix of fly kick and free kick and I also do a good mix of kicking on my stomach and on my back when I'm doing underwaters. My, which interesting is my DPS or 
distance per kick DPK, I guess, mm -hmm. is actually uh, greater on my stomach than on my back, but kicking on my back is faster. So I don't know what that exactly means, but um, we've been mixed around with a little bit of tempo trainer kick this fall, which I think is super fun. I love to try to mix up the amplitude of my kick and find a good balance in there and try to keep a good amplitude, but then increase the tempo. So I, I love mixing it up and trying new things and um, don't do too much soft kick, but that's oh, in the past I have, and that's super, super challenging. Um, what about in terms of, um, okay, your, your head position in your streamline, are you the type that has the head out and down or are you tucked into your streamline? I think it's a little bit forward. My, my arms like land a little bit behind my back, but it's not too much. Like okay. my head's not tucked towards my chest. Um, and I really, my kick, I feel like comes a lot more from my, my chest and my core, um, trying to keep my my arms and my shoulders pretty still. So right. I'm not like bouncing back and forth too much. Okay. Um, okay. So it's, yeah. So it's like from, from the shoulders up, you're trying to stay very kind of rigid, not a lot of movement here, but then the movement is basically starting from the chest and, and through the core. There's a lot of kind of, is it kind of just like a wave? How do you initiate it? Mm -hmm. I think a lot about my core and, um, my glutes, I think, um, my, I remember talking to one teammate and she said that her quads really kill her when she's really trying to push her underwaters. But for me, it's more my hamstrings really working that up kick. Uh -huh. um, and what I'm really working on in warm up, thinking about working my kick, I'm thinking like really using my core to bring uh -huh. my um, hips and chest down and uh -huh. then before I bring, extend. So, um, okay. I love to break it down and warm up before I put it all together. So each part of the kick is warmed up and ready right. to go. Okay. Every year people ask me what they should get their swimmer for Christmas. And I always tell them the same thing. Get a pair of drag socks made by Aquavolo. It's the perfect stocking stuffer for any swimmer. Honestly, there's no simpler training tool to build power in the water than a pair of drag socks. Go to aquavolo.com and use the code Brett. B-R-E-T-T -T at checkout and save 10%. Do you focus on keeping your knees and ankles together or is there any separation there at all? I think there's a little bit. I was actually thinking about this yesterday that I think my toes kind of like come together. My ankle flexibility is, is pretty good and you pretty much have to have great ankle flexibility to be a, a really good underwater kicker. And I think that the toes come together just a little bit with my ankles a little farther apart. Mm -hmm. Um um, but I'm not like consciously thinking about that gap, but I think because my quads are a little big, there's a little gap between my knees. <laughs> right, right. Now, um, I was going to say something. In terms of building the strength in the water, you, you do it in the gym for sure, and I want to maybe touch on a couple of exercises for that. But in the water, what are some of the things you're doing to build strength, especially for your underwater kick? You, you do a lot of resistance? We do resistance with a – power tower and power rack on our power days. Okay. Um, but that's, that's what we've been focusing on mainly this fall. Um, you do you do really, parachutes at all? Um, here and there, not too consistently. Not okay. What about um, fin kick? You do a lot of fin kick? Um, here and there as well. Nothing too crazy. And really I try not to think about the kick. Like I think about when we do like turns in practice, like mm -hmm. if you only work on your turns in those eight twenty fives or whatever it is, like you're not really going to improve your turns because you need to be thinking about every single turn because at the end of a race, you're going to revert to your bad turn. And so I'm mm -hmm. thinking every wall, how can I have the best, most efficient kickoff and push off? And we would do in our aerobic this fall, okay, off each, off the first few reps, we're going to do no kicks, just carry your speed. And off the next four reps, we're going to do one kick and then two kicks. And so that's when I'm working on my push offs and my kicks every, every turn, not just, okay, really think about your kicks on this 
this view underwater set because you're not going to really get better if you're only working on it for a small percentage of your practices. Right. All right, let's move from the kick then. Uh, I think we've talked about that a bit. What about in terms of power in the front of your stroke? Where are you looking to hit in terms of your hands? How are you holding on to water? And, and what's going on underneath your body? Like, What are you thinking in terms of holding water underneath your body as well? I think my fly pull is a little bit different than what some people teach in that uh, try to enter like shoulder width apart. This is mm -hmm. a hard... <laughs> I can't yeah, really demonstrate. <laughs> but entering shoulder width apart and really extending and trying to uh, pop my elbow and catch as much water right at the the front of the catch, mm -hmm. um, and then I try to come down pretty straight. I don't try to do like the coming in in my waist and then like the hourglass shape. Gotcha. I like to try to think about um, carrying as much water. Um, Arthur talks about trying to like pull a barrel underneath of you. Um, and I like to joke around and pretend like a panda because I think that's a little more fun than a barrel. But to carry it like, and push a barrel underneath you, you need to be like elbows up and um, to catch as much water as you can and to not drop your elbow. And so um, that's what I like to think about is having that high elbow catch. And it's kind of for me the same in fly and free. And then um, really accelerating through um, from my – Mid, from the middle of the pole out the back um and then bring right. it to the front so it's more more of a straight on pull for you are you thinking about driving your fingertips kind of down to the bottom of the pool yes i am trying to think about um exactly that just like almost like perpendicular to the bottom and mm -hmm. accelerating out the back mm -hmm. Now, as you come through, are you trying to pull your elbows in closer to your body as you pull down straight, or how are you finishing the stroke? Um, I guess not. It's not out too far, but um, it's hard to imagine on land. You just do it. So, just talk me through the back end of your pull again. Mm. So, as I'm coming down through my pull, um, mm -hmm. I'm still trying to keep my elbows high and still push as much water back, um, mm -hmm. but kind of bringing my hands at some point there, you have to, I'm, I'm trying to weigh the amount of, okay, if I am carrying too much, pushing too much water, it's going to affect my tempo. And right. so at some point, my hands kind of, um, they stay down and I'm rather, rather than thinking about pushing water back, my hands come um, out back more, still pushing um, my fingers down rather than carrying, cupping the water and pushing it up. So they kind of relax right. out the back to relax a little bit. Yeah. Kind forward. of let go a little mm -hmm. bit. Now are you, are you coming then exiting and then coming around flat on the surface of the water? Uh, a lot of, a lot of, you know, new age butterflies are staying very flat, kind of like Phelps, you know, was the kind of the first to do this where speed in the recovery and hands very flat to get back out in front. I think that sounds like me. Um, yeah, pretty low to the surface. Um, yeah. And just trying to enter around to the top and getting ready to, to have my fingertips pointing down right away so I can catch okay. water as soon as my fingertips enter. Okay, nice. All right. There we go. We got super technical there. Some people will like that. We'll see how we go. But uh that's butterfly. That's the <laughs> world's world's fastest butterfly in history, short course history right there, tell, telling you how to swim. So I'd like to introduce our newest sponsor, Swim Angelfish. Swim Angelfish is an online certification program that strengthens your teaching curriculum to serve swimmers of all abilities. Swim Angelfish will prepare you and your instructors with the skills to teach swimmers with autism, physical disabilities, anxiety, sensory and motor conditions, and more. Learn to teach skills faster and with more comfort with Swim Angelfish. Apply for an only alpha pool product scholarship and receive up to 50% off your certification. Go to swimangelfish.com today to apply. Um, you know, listen, you're at, you're 27 now, and you you miss the Olympic team by a spot, and you decide 
uh, well, I guess everybody has a decision of what they want to do then. You know, it's like, do I, do I quit? But you decide to make some changes. Um, had you been thinking about the changes before and why did you decide to make the changes now? Mm -hmm. Well, I did miss the team by two spots. So it wasn't, it was still a couple of tenths, but uh, you finished fourth? I knew that fourth. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I thought um, you finished third. So I knew that this last year and a half for everyone has been super challenging. And for me, it's been one of the most mentally challenging couple of years. And the, uh, the grind and the aerobic and everything, just my body was just so exhausted. And I knew I needed to make some changes. So um, I've been same training for so many years now. And I saw the success of our sprint program. And I knew I didn't want to leave Louisville. I, I love the coaching staff and I wanted to continue working with them and staying here. So I just needed to change my training up a little bit more mentally. And I think as an older woman in the sport, we don't know too much about females training to a later age. A lot of females in the sport, especially in America, stop in their mid earlier twenties. And so uh, I wanted to, to try something a little bit different. And uh, so I, I started after Olympic trials, just swimming with my husband outside. It was therapeutic for me. I wasn't trying to do anything fast, trying to keep anything aerobic or really get any right. times. I just love to keep the feel of the water and love to outside. And yeah. so that's what I did for the first couple of weeks. Then I started to get in the weight room a little bit more and try to see if I could build some strength. COVID of anything helped me to enjoy lifting for one of the first times. I really never really enjoyed lifting too much. I felt like it made me feel bad in the water. But when I wasn't mm. swimming as much in COVID, it was the one thing that was consistent. And so I do think I built a lot of strength during the pandemic. And so once those first couple of weeks after trials hit, I thought I was going to start doing doubles again, but I was enjoying singles and enjoying living life outside of swimming. And so I kept doing singles and it was going well. And honestly, I wasn't sure how Naples was going to go. I mm. was getting ready for that first match and thinking, I don't want to get this suit on. <laughs> I was trying to fabricate some sort of emotion, some sort of adrenaline to try to get ready to race. Uh, but then it went really well. I swam faster than I did a lot of the previous season. And uh, that helped with my confidence as well, knowing that, okay, this adjustment to my training is working. Right, right. I mean, it, it's an interesting thing to analyze like you know i look at it as okay you had you had a change in a drastic change in your training and kind of like your mental outlook it was, you know everything was kind of refreshed so there's that aspect of it but then you know critics will say well she only had success because she did the work th this type of work previously in her career so what i'm i'm trying to get at analyze is like could you have been just as successful as you are right now if you had have been doing this training four or five years ago? What's your thoughts on that? Mm. That's a really good question and something that I've thought about myself. And I also want to say that this was a really good time for me to experiment this new training because it's short course. I think I would need a little bit more substance in terms of aerobic and uh, with to do a long course swimming. Um, I think also the mental aspect of it has helped mm -hmm. me just enjoy training much more that I'm not running around exhausted all the time. Uh, right. My, my shoulders don't ache like they had been just overall, my body feels so much better because it's not exhausted. Like I had been all these years. And so I think that there, I had more room to to do this training over those last four years and um, it would have helped me physically and mentally um, but I would I can't say that um, 
I, I do think I, there was a time for that as well. And so Arthur is a big believer in doing the work and grinding and doing a lot of work. And so I think he had brainwashed me a little bit all these years because I was worried too, thinking I didn't do the work I needed to do. That's mm. why I was nervous going into ISL. I thought I can't be successful doing this training. And so I had mm. to like rewire my brain to think, okay, maybe I can be and still uh, swim fast, e even though it's different, doesn't mean it's bad. There's also a lot of people that will say, well, that type of training will work for men, but it won't work for women. And, and you're proving right now that it's working for you. But there's, there's also, I think what we're kind of overlooking here is that there is a, a big strength component to what you're doing. I mean, you're working probably harder in the gym and, and maybe even better in the gym than you've ever worked before, right? Mm -hmm, that's true. I'm still lifting three times a week. But I've been able to really push it. I've always been scared to think, okay, if I go to failure in this set, mm. or if I really try to to push it, am I, am I will I even be able to touch my toes, or will I be able to push off the wall? Am I just going right. to sink? And when I'm not, when I don't have to do twelve two hundreds aerobic best average, like it, that doesn't matter as much. It doesn't matter if my arms fall off in the weight room because uh, I have more time to recover. And I have more time to see what I can do in the weight room. Right, right, exactly. Well, specifically, what are some of the exercises you're doing to build strength right now in the weight room? Mm. I was doing a lot more in the beginning of the season, uh, tempo-based things in squats and um, deadlift and in bench press. We don't do mm -hmm. too many crazy things. We do a lot of um, – general normal lifts um, but then mm -hmm. a lot of like explosive stuff in terms of jumping i love doing jumps i love med ball slams mm -hmm. and i love to see yeah how high i can get i like to think i'm good until the, the jumpers come in and then they do that one legged and so then i <laughs> realized i'm not as good as i thought i was but for summers i would say i'm, I'm pretty athletic in the weight room <laughs> and uh, we do a uh, pull up or chin ups and always pairing that with a smaller exercise as well. But um, I was able to, yeah, to actually push that weight and it made a lot of fun. Where are you better? Are you better upper body or lower body strength? Lower body is my, my strength in, yeah. in terms of the weight room. My shoulders have always had different impingements. And I think it comes more from the, the overuse in the pool. But that then affects how much I can push in the weight room. Right. Well, well, you've had, you've had this change to Chris and the, and the sprint group and some, some sprint philosophy, which I'm happy that you're doing that by the way. <laughs> um, I love it. Um, but, but you, and then you've had success. You're breaking world records now. So it's like, okay, maybe there was a point in time where you were like, should I keep going now? Now you're happy. You're swimming fast. Have, have you kind of taken those thoughts away now of like, I'm, I'm going to quit swimming now? Like, are you kind of like on a path towards Paris now? I, I won't say that I'm on a path towards Paris yet, but um, right now I'm reevaluating. I'm having fun. Yesterday I got to swim with Joao DeLuca and that was mm. a, it, it's fun. He's one, he's like my big brother. And so mm. I miss getting to train with him and um, I'm not on training trip with the team this year. I uh, was invited, but I politely declined that they do some crazy stuff and um, didn't quite want to mm -hmm. sell my soul to do those <laughs> workouts. You've done that before. But <laughs> I've had enough of, I have did my time in there, but uh. um, reevaluating right now where I want to go to leaning towards um, sh the sh uh, international trials, I guess, in April. That would be the next thing to go towards. So that's what I'm thinking about. Um, that my training towards right now, but Paris is still three years away and people say it's only, well, I guess two and a half years now. It's only mm. two and a half years, but on the day to day, that feels really long. So I'm not making any commitments either way right now. Um, what about your sponsors? You got a, a couple of sponsors. Talk, tell us about who, who sponsors you right now. Mm -hmm. So Louisville has really embraced me. It's one of their own. I've got some great sponsors locally pro rehab, physical therapy, worked with them as a patient, I guess, 
since 2016. Mm. And then uh, Louisville Water Company has been a great fit. And they've been my sponsor since this summer. And then I work with Tier. I've been with them all in college and then since 2016. And then I also work with USANA. They are mm -hmm. a supplement skincare company, which is great as a swimmer. We have to battle the chlorine and believe, I believe that's it. But I've been super fortunate that they've all allowed me to be able to swim full time and focus yeah. on my goals in the water. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I was there when you broke uh, 50 seconds for the first person to break 50 seconds short course yards. I was on the pool deck. I watched that incredible swim. Um, to be honest, I haven't seen you look that good again, mm. you know, since uh, since like two weeks ago. So it's like you still got it, girl. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's plenty, plenty there. Um, you look incredible you. right now. So I would not uh, I would not back away from kind of committing to another couple of years. There's, there's still plenty there. I think you're tapping into something which is pretty exciting in terms of the sprint training and the, the strength training and the possibilities that you have for yourself this new exploration I think uh, is exciting. So listen, I would recommend you keep going just out of my <laughs> own selfish, uh, you know, want. So um, I hope you do make that decision, but um, listen, I appreciate you coming on today, sharing some of your experiences and digging deeper into stuff, but uh, I appreciate your time today. Thanks, Kelsey. Thanks for having me, Brett. It was really great talking with you. Excellent. All right. Good luck. And uh, we'll see you soon. Looking to host your first swim meet or replacing an old timing system. Run a swim meet with ease from your laptop using superior swim timing. You can use superior swim timing with your existing equipment, or they can provide you with a complete timing solution, including deck harnesses, buttons, and starter. SST is fully compatible with HiTech and Team Unify, as well as Colorado, Dactronics, and Amiga touchpads. Go to superiorswimtiming.com to learn more and be sure to tell them I sent you.